So, hello everyone for the second session. Now I'll introduce you uh, Professor Shogato Baduri, teaches at the Center for mm -hmm. English Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. His areas of interest are contemporary literature and cultural theory with focus on post-theoretical developments, contemporary popular culture with focus on the technologized mass media, as well as folk cultural forms. His recently published book is Polycoloniality, European Transactions with Bengal from the 13th to the 19th century. Now over to you, Professor. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So we have three presentations and uh, as the, uh, the organizers have let me know uh, quite, uh, let's say seriously, that the time al uh, allocated to each presenter is just 20 minutes. So uh, please stick to your time because uh, otherwise it will be very rude on my part to interrupt you. Uh, so I'll, I'll introduce the speakers one after the other and we can have the presentations um, all in one row and we'll still have about half an hour uh, for discussion. So 20 minutes uh, for your presentations uh, and are, or are we going to discuss the papers after each Ten presentation? Minutes. Yes, yes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, great, 30, great. That, that's always, always a better way to proceed about uh, it. So our first presenter is Anne Susan Alias, and she's a PhD scholar at Jamia Media Islamia, and her paper is called Tracing Cosmopolitan Geographies of Christian Margam in Malabar, a study of select southeast, southeast Syrian Christian folk traditions. So yes, Sir Anne, your time begins now and please make your presentation. Thank you, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, perfect. So, um, uh, Professor Bhaduri has already read out my title. Um, I do not need to emphasize that again, and most of you may have already read uh, the abstract. However, I'd like to uh, quickly um, um, clarify a particular term that I've used in the title in case some of you are not familiar with it, which is the term Malabar. Now, the term Malabar is, um, uh, is used, has been used and continues to be used to denote the region which is currently uh, overlapping with the territory of Kerala, which is the south, um, the southernmost state of Kerala, the southwest state of India. Okay. Um, and uh, this term itself uh, was initially used uh, by uh, uh, you know uh, uh, merchants as they were you know traveling through the oceans, and the term itself comes from uh, uh, two. I mean, it has two origins. Uh, the term uh, Malabar comes from the Dravidian language, or in Malayalam, uh, it means mala, which means hill, and uh, bar has uh, you know either roots in Persian or Arabic, which comes to mean land. So you're looking at uh, a term which was well used at one point and today now of course this, this region is called as uh, Kerala. So um, what I'd like to, uh, where I'd like to, where, well I think I should start with the, uh, my paper now, my presentation now. Um, so the historical trajectory of the arrival and growth of Christianity in India would invariably find its precarious footing in the pre-modern narrative of the apostolic mission of St. Thomas in India. The, history of, the historicity of this narrative continues uh, to remain at the realm of academic conjecture, given the absence of veritable written documentation, an edifice upon which, of course, modern historiography extensively relies on. Despite this being the case, St. Thomas's apostolic mission in India has been positioned as the originary narrative to the arrival of Christianity in India or has been considered probable for two reasons. One is uh, uh, because of the presence of strong living traditions of St. Thomas Christians in Malabar, uh, in contemporary Kerala and in the Coromandel coast. And the second was uh, the existence of thriving trans-regional trade networks in pre-modern times, both oceanic and terrestrial. So maritime activity in pre-modern times were primarily characterized by mercantile movements through um, uh, and uh, through the spice route, accelerated by uh, the Greek navigator Hippolas's discovery of the monsoon winds. Traders from Mediterranean, Egypt, and Arabian Peninsula reliably traveled to East and Southeast Asian regions in search of commodities and markets. 
The rich spice producing regions of Malabar rose into prominence overseas for the suitability of climatic and agronomic conditions for the cultivation of pepper, which was also known as black gold in the West, um, amongst, of course, other precious commodities. Added to this, the geophysical advantage of Malabar with its extended coastlines and favorable political policies of the local rulers brought further fame to the ancient port cities of Mosurus and others were Tindus, Bakare, Nelkinda, and Komorin. This, these dynamic oceanic trade networks, many of which converged towards Malabar, mobilized commodities, humans, cultures, and religions. Two such were uh, Judaism and Christianity in the early years of Christian era. So as for Christianity, um, as I just mentioned, uh, it is considered or it is believed that St. Thomas came to Malabar, uh, converted uh, certain Brahmin families and thus set forth the beginning of the indigenous line of uh, Christians in, um, in, uh, in Malabar. Now, of course, let me now quickly come to the subject of my, uh, it's already five minutes into the presentation. I have timed myself. Ah, so, uh, the, the, of course, the subject of my analysis here is, is a particular section uh, under St. Thomas Christians. I would like to suggest and sort of emphasize this because otherwise it will lead to a lot of confusion later on, that the term St. Thomas Christian encompasses and eclipses two Christian narratives, uh, apologies, two Christian collectives who have historically organized themselves differently. And these, uh, uh, and, and of course, in, from the 19th century onwards, there has been so many schisms and a lot of denominations, et cetera, et cetera. But two ethnically distinct communities were the Northis and the Southis, okay? And the particular interest of this paper is the ethnic narrative of the Southist Syrian Christians. Um, so uh, I think I will now move on to the narrative here. So the Southist Christians trace their ancestry to the legendary migration of a group of Christians from Mediterranean region to the coast of Malabar in AD 345 under the leadership of an illustrious merchant, Thomas of Knai. So they, they're also known as Knanayakar because that would mean the followers of Knai uh, uh, Thomen. And of course, along with this particular merchant came the Oriental Bishop uh, Urhama Joseph. Uh, there were 400 people with 772 uh, families and several deacons and priests. So they migrate to uh, the coast of Malabar. And they come down, they arrived by ship at Kodungalur or Kranganur, which coincides with the port city of Mussuris. They later settled in the south of Mahateburpuram city. Uh, which is at the south bank of Periyar, and therefore this geographical location, by this geographical location, they came to be known as Southis. And then you have the indigenous Christians who are on the north bank of the river Periyar, and they are known as Northis. Now, this geographical, uh, though the term Southis and Northis demarcate geographical positioning of settlements, what is interesting for us is how this uh, distinction is also uh, extended over ethnic and uh, cultural claims. So the Southeast Christians practice a very distinct uh, set of folk songs and folk traditions. Uh, and the Southeast Christians claim that their bloodline is pure and they're endogamous. They don't marry from outside. They of course fall in the St. Thomas tradition, um, uh, but uh, they, they, they have uh, you know, specific uh, ethnic uh, imageries or narrative that comes with them. Now, once they migrate, um, they come down, they were favorably received by the local, local rural Sheraman Perumal. They were granted 72 royal privileges, uh, which included social cultural rights, mercantile rights, and they settled down uh, in the land. And they were also given power over the four sects of artisans known as Nangudi Parishagal. So eventually, as time will move on, this community will integrate themselves into the existing jati or caste system of, uh, uh, of the then Malabar, you know. So uh, that, is, that is as far as for now what I'm interested in, in terms of giving you a sense of this, this originary narrative or this migratory narrative rather. Now, for the purpose of uh, uh, analysis in my, in my paper, I am looking at 
two folk songs by the Southeast Christians. And I'm looking at an extract of, from their Southeast Christian wedding traditions. Both of them, as in the songs and the extract, has been taken from the first printed anthology of their work in 1910. Okay, so I will, I think I should move on to that. So I will just share my screen. And the songs have been translated. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the time to listen to them. So I have translated the songs. Uh, this was an existing translation with few changes made by me, uh, but very select changes. Let me share the screen. Um, just a second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So that's uh, the title. And this is the first uh, song. Just a second. All right. So I'm glossing over and I'm skipping over, in fact, uh, uh, the specific customs and traditions or you know, the division of songs and the genre classifications, etc. And I'm simply looking at the narrative here. And these songs are mostly sung. Uh, this is written in Malayalam, by the way. And this contains Syriac and Tamil, very, very few words, Syriac and Tamil traces. Um, and also these songs, as I said, are sung uh, during wedding ceremonies. But it, it all talks about this narrative, this migratory narrative. So this is the first song, which is in the good city of Jerusalem. And as you can see, I will not take the time to read it out loud, or maybe I will a couple of lines. In the good city of Jerusalem, in the land where emeralds and pearls grow, of the Lord resplendent as a dan dancing peacock, the complexion, I may say, resembles gold of 10 and a half carats. He speaks like Chinese flute. He's not lacking in religious zeal. The noble Lord wants to reign Malabar. He's, he started by Bawa's. Bawa is the patriarch, the religious head. He obtained his permission and forthwith set out his journey. He was given high social rank. He was given several privileges and he fittingly uh, he was fittingly sent off with regal musical instruments. This is all describing the uh, preparation or the preparatory stages of the journey by uh, Knai Pomma, who is the merchant uh, hero. And uh, this is about the group who embarks the ship and their arrival in Kranganur. Um, and uh, uh, there is a reference to the palaquin, et cetera, et cetera. We do not have the time to closely analyze it, but I will make a few remarks uh, here you can perhaps take the time to also read through it as I'm speaking. So the song Nalor Urushilim succinctly captures the legendary journey of the Southeast Christians from the land of Knai in Edessa. Um, and as you can see here, the song, um, as while describing this journey and its leader, the descriptive qualifiers used allude to objects of transoceanic circulation, such as Chinese flutes and peacocks and pearls and emeralds. These opulent symbols are then, uh, it's interesting that these global and opulent symptoms, uh, uh, symbols feature in the, in the culture, local cultural, the localized expression, the local cultural expressions of the Southeast Christians. Now, what is also interesting here are the intentions that is being given. Um, it says that the Lord wanted to reign uh, Malabar. Now, the first, um, yeah, the Lord wants to reign and this, what is interesting there is uh, Knai Thumma's aspiration of governing in Malabar as it emerges in the song is not of militarized colonization, but of cultural translation, which unfolds in the context of trade. Um, and time and again, scholars have used the term Christian colonization to account for the, this particular migration. Uh, but I would differ from that because of uh, the peculiar nature of adaptation that happens here, as opposed to one that seeks to dominate local culture. So as you see in uh, the narrative itself, this community obtains privileges and sanctions to rule from the local a ruler and Knai Tomma continues to function as a satellite ruler um, and, and one who's responsible for uh, maintaining the prevailing political structure, the socio-political order of the land. Uh, so what you're looking at is an interesting way in which um, uh, the leader himself is now um, assimilated into or through this narrative, as you see, the leader in the community assimilates into uh, the socio-cultural fabric of then Kerala. This is another song which is called Munam Malankari, which uh, 
means before Malabar migration. Uh, you may, if it is not too difficult, you may read it on your own at this point, uh, while I sort of comment uh, on it because of the limitations of time. So as you can see, um, if you read ahead, you will see that the various privileges are mentioned here. Um, so what I'm trying to say is the set of royal privileges granted to these community of Christians positioned them in a social stature that was parallel to the Nayas from the ninth century. Uh, it would also be worth noting that in the absence of an organized trading class within existing ranks of the social uh, structure, uh, which eventually of course reifies into caste system as I had mentioned previously, the Southists were well integrated. So what I want to then highlight is how conventionally when you talk about accounts of Christianity in India, you tend to end uh, uh, a scholar such as uh, Stephen Neal emphasizes or even regional scholars by regional, I mean the church scholars apologies, uh, emphasize on the Christian aspect of their migration and their motivation. But I would like to bring to the focus the aspect of trade and I would like to also bring to the focus how they adapted into the socio-cultural fabric and the Jadi consciousness, which becomes central in this, in this mode of adaptation. Um, I would also like to um, highlight an extract from their wedding ceremony. Let me quickly read this out. All the invited, this is, this is a ceremony which is practiced on the fifth day of uh, the wedding um, celebrations. And I am quoting, and this is the text that I've translated from the, from the text that I've mentioned here, which is the ancient songs of Syrian Christians of Malabar in 1910. And I'm reading from it. All the invited guests will arrive at the man's house and partake in the dinner feast. After that, they will assemble together in the pantal. Pantal means a gathering uh, or a certain structure which, which will habitate the gathering. At this time, the man's sister would prepare a special seating with special cloth laid over it, keep it in the middle of the pantal, etc., etc., etc. And at this time, the caste wise barber would come on the front side of the pantal and with due reference to the custom, shout and ask, Padinam Barisha Malo Rode, may I come in and sit inside? to andam charta. Andam charta means to clean, to make, to make beautiful. So the barber essentially enters in with the permission of the folks who have gathered there and he uh, trims the hair and beautifies the, the group, right? Uh, you can read a little bit, but what you see here is, is very interesting uh, because the Southeast wedding traditions are not only replete with the aforementioned royal privileges, the use of pandal, pavada, etc. Uh, shape, uh, you know, is, is shows us, demonstrates this to us. Similarly, the customary appearance of the barber who reverently besieges permission is ordered in and quickly leaves the pandal after the completion of his assigned caste-based job, performatively animating the social memory of Southeast's privileged past. The presence of the social other is then not merely a practical necessary, but a symbolic function of performing Southeast's claim to an ancestry. Uh, which is, of course, superior to other uh, communities, Christian or otherwise, right? Uh, what is also interesting, may I suggest, is the fact that many of their songs, uh, their traditions, all of that are also starkly similar to the Jewish songs, uh, the Jews who stayed along with them or presumably stayed along with them at one point. Um, so you're also looking at a very interesting hybrid formation here, uh, which, which evidences not just adaptation, but also a certain, uh, an interesting uh, uh, way in which Christianity adopted, which is my proposition in this paper, to understand Christianity as marga. And let me quickly, I have three minutes left, so let me quickly get to that. The term margam literally translates to mean the way and proliferates much of the Southeast Christian folklore. It must be noted that this terminological use is not restricted Christian practices alone, but has been used in vernacular tongue to refer to Buddhism and Jainism, etc. The connotations of Margam points towards the imaginary of a system of practices which had not yet consolidated into a rigid ideological edifice that was wholly homogeneous and by extension then radically separating itself from other ways of living or being. Instead, uh, Christianity in India, in fact, uh, early Christianity in India, it, it developed in the all-encompassing uh, framework of other regional culture, adapting and translating itself into it without quite dis diffusing itself. 
the particular organization of Christian Markham had escaped the attention of few renowned scholarship in the field, etc. As I mentioned, Stephen Neal is somebody that I would um, uh, talk about in my paper. In such a conception, so in in many uh, in uh, you know conventional, um, maybe I'll skip over that. Let me quickly emphasize here that Christian Margam in Malabar was essentially, uh, you know, one that was a historical phenomena, which was affected by, uh, you know, uh, the trade activities where trade was uh, uh, an important factor in defining the contours of exchange and uh, you know, movement that happened there. Um, so what is interesting is, uh, you know, for us to look at, if any of you are interested, it may be worth the while to look at the Synod of Diamper, which happens in 1599. Uh, this, this is essentially when the East meets the West. So with the Portuguese Fadrado's intervention, uh, you're looking at this, this uh, you know, attempt to reorganize uh, Christianity in India or Christianity in Malabar. And you have the Synod of Diamper, which is quite violent, where the Padrado would call the regional Christians as heretics. And they seek to rectify the errors of the regional Christians by, again, that eventually led to the burning of several Syrian um, documents of this particular community, along with the indigenous Christians. Now, I would like to just show you a last slide, which is a uh, a recent, by recent I mean 1970s depiction of Kanai Thomma. Uh, this is Kanai Thomma. So contemporary visual representation of the legendary hero Kanai Thomma has should be seen uh, as a product of, of uh, the religious consolidation that happens post 17th century, 16th, 17th century. It's my timer. Uh, what I would simply like to suggest here is if you look at the image, you will see that Knaithoma is molded in um, an almost same, as an almost, uh, you know, in a saintly fashion, right? He's carrying the scepter and uh, the copper plates and et cetera, et cetera. It's almost like a saint. And if you actually look behind, you can see, you can see uh, ships in the background. So the proposition that I would like to make is in order to understand the contours of Christian Markham uh, in pre-modern times, uh, which emerged in the context of maritime activities, you need to foreground that which is in the background and understand that you know, Christianity did not uh, originate as a codified set of dogmas or values. It in fact developed in isolation away from the centers um, and was highly dependent on the kind of exchanges and interactions that happened um, in the littoral zones and later elsewhere. Thank you. I think I should stop there. Yeah, and thank you very much. And thank you for self-timing yourself and sticking to the time. Um, and I'm sure there'll be several questions. It was a, a wonderful uh, presentation. So Dilip already has a question, uh, right. So um, is the idea to read out the questions or can the, can the paper reader read it herself? But there, is, there are several questions which will come up, I'm sure, uh, continuously. I'll, I'll probably uh, read them okay. out. Uh, right. The rabbiteers yeah. can read. So, so there are questions. Maybe Should I just read and respond? Hello? I think that would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Or Anne, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first is to elaborate on the Jadi consciousness uh, that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, um, again, this consciousness is one that even pervades today. Um, so this community is very active in these traditions are living traditions. Of course, uh, things have changed, but uh, there is there is this emphasis on, like I said, purity, uh, pure bloodline, or uh, that we were somehow uh, higher than you know other castes. And there is a very strong consciousness even today. But to go back to the question, uh, what I was trying to say that uh, the, the cultural narrative of this community, the ethnic narrative of this community um, uh, remembers and through this, you know, uh, or there's a cultural memory where in which uh, they were received by the merchant ruler, granted so-and-so rights. And most of these rights, the 72 royal privileges that were granted to these communities, uh, to this community, uh, were one that, you know, sort of placed them uh, uh, in a higher social ladder. So later from the 19th century onwards, when caste system would get rigidified, 
uh, uh, what you're seeing is that they take or they're equal in, in terms of uh, the position of Nayars. So it's also interesting to note that this community was also practiced untouchability. Um, and um, in fact, there was, there was, and this is again scholarly work around it, the narrative does not, uh, the, the folk narratives do not talk about that, but just as you know, the, the sections that we looked at something along those lines, but those other scholarly uh, works have suggested that, you know, sometimes uh, when uh, you would, I mean, if, if the higher caste had touched uh, the lower caste or they have been considered defiled, um, the Christian, and this is again general for the St. Thomas Christians too, the Christian's touch would purify it. Um, so there were uh, practices such as this, um, although, uh, of course, this consciousness that I've referred to, the Jadi consciousness within this particular folk narrative is restricted to simply a demonstrative, a performative, um, you know, kind of animation of uh, social superiority or um, and, and even in, in contemporary times too, conversations, well, it doesn't take the overt tone of it, but the, the, the idea of superiority um, um, sort of emphasizes or underlines much of their um, you know, self-presentation is what I would like to say. And uh, the second question is also, how is the community locally cosmopolitan when it is a highly endogamous group, uh, despite uh, oceanic Transocean. That's actually a very good question, um, but uh, I think I think perhaps I would have to rethink the term cosmopolitan. It may not suit the purposes of uh, uh, what I'm trying to argue through my paper, uh, because it's 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 also it's very it's 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 very um, centric. It's very ethnocentric, um, and uh, the narrative seemed to produce hybrid formations and showed uh, you know a less solidified, like a um, sort of a less uh, rigidified uh, notions of, uh, you know, Christian Christianity and social interactions, which is why I thought that, you know, that would fit the framework. But now after hearing myself talk about it, I'm wondering that it may not be uh, the right term to use in this context, not necessarily because of the endogamous nature, uh, but because of the kind of, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, or, you know, the self-conception that goes behind this particular cultural narrative. You, I mean, I'll be happy if some suggestions come my way so that I can actively sort of also uh, remold my paper later. Right, and so I'll uh, read out the next question then. Okay. So we have a question from Professor Dilip Menon. While you show clearly how the uh, Kanana and Christians are- Juby, I, I think she has already responded to those two questions. Let her move on to the third question. Right, okay, okay sir. Okay, sir. So uh, we have Stephen's question. It is an interesting paper with exploration into unexplored junctures. It's fair to see the venture of Christianity as a margam. It's an interesting proposition as it highlights the evolution and exchange with the locals. However, would you see the Christians of Kerala in the contemporary? Do you still hold on to a margam potential, considering margam as a philosophical conception that you propose? Uh, certainly not in contemporary times, uh, although remnants of it still stays practiced outside um, of uh, church uh, kind of authority. As I mentioned, interestingly, the folk songs and the folk uh, traditions that I have used for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, they themselves have now been uh, converted into print since 1910, and the later publications were all uh, church sanctioned, you know. So the written text, all of that is highly mediated by the tech, uh, the church. So, um, and, and there are, you know, uh, there's constant monitoring and, you know, songs are being taught or whatever. The cultural sort of uh, life is now highly governed by the church. So, um, and that has a lot to do with the kind of uh, meeting that happened between the West and the East since, uh, let's say, 16th century, 16th century onwards. So the margam may um, may exist as, as a residue in terms of the fact that there are still Southeast Christians who uh, go to the astrologer or, or who still adopt certain Hindu beliefs and superstitions, uh, but that 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 operates in the periphery and not uh, not as as a central kind of, it, that, that is dominated by the institution of the church and the world is quite rigid there. Uh, uh, okay, and I think Dilip's question is still unanswered in a way. So his focus is on whether you should also analyze the words and the themes and the performative gestures, the performance, the texts in themselves. Will not that be a very important thing to do uh, for these songs? 
certainly, certainly. Uh, for this paper, and I hope to do that, this is also my PhD paper. Also, I haven't read your full question. I had accidentally moved on to the next one. But from what Sir Professor Baduri had said, mentioned, certainly I hope to take that up uh, uh, as, I, as I further my research, and it will certainly will. But for this paper, um, you know, I wanted my idea was to focus on Margum. So I e extracted uh, select uh, songs and, you know, uh, aspects which I thought might work or might suit uh, the argument that I was trying to make. But right. thank you. Thank yeah, you. And the performances also, because that is also what the has asked. So maybe uh, you have to also um, kind of look at the actual performative and analyze the rhythms, the dance moves, to, uh, to paraphrase what uh, the lips question suggests. But as you said, you will be doing it uh, for your PhD. Uh, I think as per the time, we still have a couple of minutes to go because you started yeah. at uh, 30, 1532. Um, so uh, uh, maybe, I mean, but there, I don't see any further questions. So I, I had this very curious, oh yes, Juby, please. So, okay, uh, Anne, so I had a question. Uh, so do you find any traces of these folk songs in current Christian tradition in any, in practiced in any sect, for example, uh, I'm a Martuma, right? So to know that uh, that we had uh, folk songs sung, and for example, like there's this line called "Vanil Nindum Oru Magudam." That's a line that the priest says to the groom as he's blessing the, you know, uh, the uh, the chain that he's going to wear. But that same line is used in Orthodox communities and Jacobite communities, and in mine, right? So do you think that there are traces of the folk songs that you have mentioned? Do they find um, traces? currently so the jacobite and the orthodox uh, they, they share the same uh, liturgy uh, very similar uh, same liturgy i think and also the songs are again that that sort of division only happens from the 19th century onwards with schisms that develop in the church um, so and i'm not sure if you can call the songs which are sung um, um, as part of the liturgy folk songs um, I don't know about this particular song, uh, but you know that's something that we may want to think about. Um, and yes, uh, the songs that I've mentioned uh, are, you know, they're very much alive and they are um, continually, I mean, continuously, even as I mentioned, they are living traditions and they are practiced till date. So all wedding ceremonies of the Klanai Christians uh, will sort of have these songs and must have these songs. Uh, so yeah, but I don't know about the other communities because again, like I was trying to articulate here, uh, it's very, uh, I mean, they, uh, some of them may have evolved based on their settlements and whatever else, but here this goes back to that narrative of migration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that would be my response. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I guess uh, it's just time and we should move on to the second paper. And thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I just like curiosity about the Chinese flute, but we will talk about that later some other time. So thank you very much, Anne. And online, I don't know whether we clap or not, but we can make gestures nevertheless. And we can uh, move on to the second presentation. And uh, the second presentation is by, let me just locate it. Uh, yeah, right. So uh, the second presentation is by Shukanna Shorka Shashmal from Shoraji United College for Women, Calcutta, and Indranil Chattopadhyay, Brahmananda Keshav Chandra College, Calcutta. And together they are going to present on Crossing the Oceans, Kalapani Prescription versus Hindu Sea Voyage Movement in Bengal in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. So Shukanna and uh, Indranil, uh, you may please start and your 20 minutes begin now. Um, are the presenters logged yes, in? Yes, uh, we are here. Oh, great, yes. And uh, Shukarna is going to present the to total paper. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. My uh, paper is Crossing the Oceans, Kalapani Proscription versus Hindu Sivaj movement in Bengal in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The term Kalapani means black water in Hindi. How this word became synonymous with crossing the sea or sea voyage? In, in Sanskrit, it was Shamudra Langhana, 
and in bengal it was samudra jatra but it became kalapani in bengal and in other parts of the country in the 19th century and it is not known but it is guessed that the bengali use of the term from hindi speaking people probably north indian and other hindustani soldiers or laborers their overseas journeys crossing the black water sometimes started from calcutta port and calcutta port played a vital role in the early years of colonial rule in the process of overseas transportation of human resource from the indian subcontinent the pen sticking and hazardous mechanism inherent to such a way of transportation has found expression in using the term kalapani in colonial penal codes to indicate deportation of lawbreakers to andaman perhaps the people of bengal became aware of or aware of the experience associated with kalapani which was an abhorrence of caste contagion whether by food preparation or contact with so called lower castes in ships maintaining ritual purity by a hindu voyager during a long sea voyage or long stay in a foreign land would have not only been difficult but impossible the rule that no hindu may cross the ocean was imposed because it was clear that no hindu can go to another country specifically europe by sea and keep caste rules about food so in 19th century europe was a forbidden land to the bengali hindus a voyage to europe meant crossing the kalapani literally meaning black water but in practice it was a hindu religious proscription against crossing the ocean secondly the countries of europe was regarded as mlecha desha where hinduism doesn't prevail in its purest form the religious ban on hindus for sea travel since the middle of the first millennium bc has been well researched by some scholars they have argued that over a long period the brahmins tried to impose regulations whenever they felt that hinduism might get a setback from large scale migration of the hindus to other overseas places or by losing its purity due to intermingling with people of other religion by the 10th century c the list of kali varja actions forbidding the kali age openly condemned engagement in regular voyages for purpose of trade the ban was really advocated in the colonial period uh, by the brahmins and some influential hindu conservatives in many parts of india including bengal out of fear of loss of ritual purity indigenous culture social status and identity though religious proscription was not a barrier for the first bengali muslim voyager who went to england in 1766 but ghanosh shama hindu brahmin was excommunicated for traveling england in 1770s in the beginning the bengali hindus were eager to go to europe maintaining their ritual purity and caste restrictions a few hindu princes set a precedent by arranging their journey in a orthodox in a thoroughly orthodox hindu style uh, speaking of hindu king of nepal jang bahadur's voyage to europe from calcutta in 1850 a, Cal- a calcutta paper remarks that his party included many brahmins who recited the gita before touching food and they had cows and ganges water meals were not cooked and the army authorities also took much care to encourage respect for caste taboos of high caste hindu soldiers regarding kalapani and in 1892 it had been advertised by an indian firm in bombay that it would arrange a steamer for a voyage to chicago for those who would attend the great congress of religion in the coming year as per their advertisement hindus will be only taken as passengers there will be brahmin cooks hindu servants and even a hindu doctor new water tanks will be carried for hindus only no animal will be killed on board the hindus have a horror of taking life for this reason even fishing will be prohibited in the same year these 
had been reflected in a Bengali drama, Kalapani, written by Amritulal Basu. It was first staged in December 1892, and uh, it was a satire directed at the contemporary craze of the affluent Bengali society to go abroad, particularly Bilet. And the storyline of the drama chiefly moved around reactions within the family of a Jamindar, Dula Chant, regarding a forthcoming tour to London or Bilayat. The subject of discussion or debate and Dula Chant and his flatterers, including female members of the family, was mainly how to overcome the orthodox Hindu rituals regarding sea traveling or crossing the so-called Kalapan. The drama begins with a song of women regarding the desperate wish of the head of the family to become a sahib and how he used to eat foreign biscuits or brandy after performing conventional Hindu purification rituals. The second scene deals with the female members of the family and uh, the third scene delineated a debate between Dulachad and Brahmin priest. Dulachad wanted a written Hindu religious authorization from them. He cited example from the Beda and Mahabharata in support of the sea voyage. On the other hand, some of the Brahmin priests expressed dissatisfaction against the basis of regional Bengali worship rituals. The head of the priest finally concluded that Bilet of London was a topo forest of Balmiki. The composer of Ramayana, the Tomosha River back then was the Thames at present. Interestingly, this satyr, criticizing stupidity and vices of the superstitious Hindus in the context of the Kalapani proscription, was highly praised by the British press. Under the heading Native Theatricals at Darjeeling, a correspondent from Darjeeling on June 14, 1896, reported that last night a comic play was staged in uh, Nipendonarayan Hall and narrating the story of the reporter writes that the following song in English was quite a piece with the rest of the play. What was the song? It was, farewell, farewell Gangaji, we will sail across the sea, bara bara babu for our freight with their lily face and belly wet, Ha ha ho ho he he he, our captain Brahmin, a genuine Kulin Brahmin, all the crew are Hindu true, from Bosu Jack to Pero Baburchi, on Christmas Eve with your leave, we will carry the Babus, both he and she. And in the second half of the century, a social change was initiated by the educated Bengalis, which aimed at weakening of caste restrictions about food, drink, and sea voyage. Actually, longing for a visit to Europe among the Western educated Bengali youth was a late 19th century phenomenon. Shurendranath Banerjee, one of the nationalist leaders of Bengal, his felicitation along with two others, Ramesh Chandra Dutt and Biharilal Gupto, by a progressive group of Bengalis on the occasion of their return from England was thought a remarkable milestone of this social movement. But the situation was different in countryside. Shurendranath was felicitated, but his family was excommunicated in his native village after his return from Europe. And this was reflected in a Bengali drama written by Narayan Chandra Bhattacharya, the uh, name was Bilet Ferot, Return from London. And uh, the story was Porish, the main character of this novel, was a um, English written person, was, was a, a person who returned from England, Bilet Ferot, and his intention of practicing medicine within his village caused rumors within the Orthodox Bengali village society. It was unusual for a doctor educated in London to practice in that kind of a remote village. Rumors also spread of his using foreign wine as medicine, consuming which would outcast any devoted Orthodox Hindu. Moreover, the doctor's wife was not being sent to her husband by her paternal house as he crossed Kalapani. 
In the 19th century, when Dijon Donald Roy, a Bengali poet, playwright, and musician, expressed his intention to go to London for further education, his father reminded him that he had to face social impediments after returning home. And he wrote a satire, satire play, Kalki Avotar, and an article at Ghori. Both of these writings had criticized Hindu Orthodox society. In Kalki Avotar, there is a satirical song regarding uh, Praj Chittar expiation mentioned in Hindu religion for crossing Kalapani had utilized both Bengali and English words with hilarious as well as effective result. Kishet Praj Chitto, theft murder or kodini, karur wife seduce karur niyashini. What's the use of expiation? Didn't commit theft or murder, neither seduce someone's wife. And later on Roy composed the drama Praj Chitto, expiation, and drama was staged at the classic theater of Calcutta with a new name, Bohut Acha. In the meantime, Hindu Sivaj movement developed in the late 1860s and in the 1890s, the movement took an organized form to facilitate the more willing person to go abroad. This social movement had its counterparts in other parts of India like Andhra, Maharashtra, but Bengal played a pioneer role and a book was published here by the Standing Committee on the Sea Voyage Question in 1894. A large and influential meeting was held at Shubha Bajar at Calcutta in 1892. Many Hindu pundits or scholars and a few Europeans attended the meeting. Meetings, meetings in support of Sea Voyage were held at the Hall of General Assembly, Presidency College, Albert Hall, Oxford Mission Hall, etc., in Calcutta and in other places of Bengal, also in Allahabad, Banaras, and Lucknow. In most of the cases, news of these meetings were reported by Indian Mirror, a Brahmo Shamaj periodical, or the Bengali, edited by Shurendranath Bandopadhyay. Interestingly, the London Daily News quoted one of the Hindu pundits who had declared the moral merits of bathing in the sea exceeded that of bathing in the Ganges, the former being indeed the repository of all the sacred waters of the world. If there be no unholiness in washing in it, there can be none in crossing it. Sea voyage was seen as an opening up the way to Western education and enterprise by cementing the relation between the ruler and the ruled. It was Swadeshi movement of 1905 and 1908 1905 to 1908 in Bengal, which acted as a catalyst for doing away with age-old barriers against sea voyage. Uh, one of the most notable, noticeable results of the Shadeshi movement in Bengal was the creation of a society uh, which uh, worked for sending Bengali students to Europe, America, or Japan to receive a modern education. The organizers of this society claimed it is not only the Western enlightenment that has helped to overcome the opposition towards Hindus visiting foreign lands and crossing the Kalapani, but necessity and advancement, the watchwords of this association have been equally responsible. It was published in a British paper. Foreign travel and Hindu shastras, a judgment given by a Bengali judge, Swisho Chandra Boshu, in the Benaras caste case, was regarded under the milestone in the movement against Kalapani proscription. It was the famous caste defamation case in which a certain Govindash claimed damages for excommunication from his caste because he had dined with Hindus who had returned from Europe. Govindas awarded damages and costs. Great expectations were revealed in the British newspapers. The sub judge is a great Sanskrit scholar written in the British newspaper, an authority on the Hindu Shastri law, and his decision is considered most important in the vexed question of sea voyage and caste. This verdict, along with Indian shipping, a book came out in 1912 by Radha Kumud Mukherjee, helped to turn the situation in favor of sea voyage to a great extent, especially sea voyages to Europe. 
Incidentally, the drowning of Titanic in the North Atlantic Ocean took place in 1912 at the triumphant moment of the Hindu Sivai movement. Bengalis were advised not to be panicked to go to sea. It was also said that if they could bear the death of a few hundred people to carry out sea voyage, they would be considered a great race in the future. A prolonged debate centering around the Kalapani prescription had been reflected in Bengali writings since the late 19th century. Pradeep, Nobbo Bharat, Bharati, a Tagore family magazine, Grigostho, and many other journals took part in it. Ponchanam Torkorapno, an eminent Sanskrit scholar, wrote about the discussion that took place at the Grand Conference of the Brahmins, attended by the Brahmins coming from different places of India. He warned the others that even 100 pitchers of waters of Jordan River could not make Brahmanism fade away, as it was similar to a color first fabric. Tarkarapno served as an editor of the magazine John Mohumi. And this magazine's role in propagating the idea of penance for crossing the ocean was condemned by a high court lawyer. He argued that uh, while the 90% religious doctrines of Raghunandan, who imposed Kalapani proscription in 16th century, were not followed in the present days, the Kalapani proscription should not be given undue importance. Moreover, he said that under the British rule, we are bound to obey their orders. As they were similar to a guru or teacher, so there was nothing wrong to go to England, as England is our Guru Griho. Akha Chandra Sharkar reported that Kayastha Conference had also decided not to impose restriction on the Kayasthas if they could manage to retain their ritual purity while crossing the ocean. And they uh, cited example from Bijayagupta's Manusha Mongol, Kobi Kankal Mukundaram's Chondi Mongol, written in the 15th and 16th century, in support of Bengali's role in uh, foreign trade. English newspapers and no, English I have writing... to ask you to, I'm sorry to interrupt, I have to ask you to conclude. Your time is over, so you may please wrap up and conclude. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, just in two minutes. May I get two minutes? Yeah, just, just wrap up. Just go. Yes, yes. Yes. English newspapers and, and English administrators supported this movement of the Hindus against the Kalapani proscription. But they didn't intervene in the Hindu society for reform. Though the government did not ban this proscription by passing law, but they criticized it severely. And they always uh, published some news, news uh, regarding Kalapani, and they sometimes they quoted Bengali newspapers. But overcoming Kalapani was not always applauded by them as a sign of progress. It could be an example of Asiatic ingen ingenuity, especially in the disturbed situation caused by the anti-partition movement in Bengal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And we are, of course, waiting for questions to come in. I'm sure there'll be uh, many questions to come. So thank you very much for pointing this out to us, especially about the Kalabani prescriptions. And right from Raghunandan's time, how uh, there was this prescription about, uh, and which was in a way quite contrary to the earlier, uh, often, often fairly, uh, let's say, what should we say, fairly boasted upon maritime exploits of Bengal in Southeast Asia and all that, which also are part of the folklore somehow. In spite of that, that Raghunandan's prescription uh, entered fairly deep into the psyche of the uh, Bengali Hindu upper caste, so much so that there would be indeed a practical prescription of crossing the Kalapani. And how towards the end of the 19th century, things changed with, uh, with uh, progressive discussions on it and meetings and deliberations, etc. So it was a wonderful uh, presentation and I'm sure there'll be uh, questions and there is uh, already a question from Dilip as we can see. And uh, so, uh, yes, it's uh, primarily upper castes. So lower castes, of course, migrated and they would have paid no attention to such prescriptions. And that is a very important point, and that is a point that has to be raised. So it was a cost. It was a. It was definitely a cost thing. 
And you also pointed out how Muslim travelers uh, did cross the Kalapani. There are numerous documented evidence, and not just from the 18th century, which you referred to, but there are at least uh, two very important works. Uh, one is by Imtiaz Habib. I'm not very sure if you're aware of it. Uh, called Black Lives in, in the English Archives from 1500 to 1677. Uh, that is uh, Imtiaz Habib's book, Black Lives in, uh, where he goes on to say that the first Bengali in London was in 1614. And someone who got baptized as Peter Pope, that is the name, in fact, King James uh, himself, King James I, himself chose the name Peter Pope for this Bengali who was brought over. So he would definitely be a lower caste Bengali probably. I mean, we, we can only speculate his antecedents or maybe even originally a Muslim, but the point still holds. So from 1614, we have a steady flow of Bengalis uh, in England and well-documented, not only in Tia Sabi's book, a more recent book by Arup Chatterjee, uh, and that is called uh, Indians in London from the uh, beginnings of the in East India Company. So uh, Indians in London, it's a very recent book. So where from 1600, he traces Indians, not only Bengalis, but uh, we can also see Bengalis there, right from Peter Pope, who was christened as Peter Pope uh, in 1614. So therefore, this is a very important question, the very first question that has been raised to you. And also the Luskers, the indentured laborers. So there is a long history, long history from the end of the 15th century itself. In fact, Imtiaz Habib goes on to show that while the first Bengali was Peter Pope in 1614 in London, uh, at least from 1590s, we have documented Indians, Salaman Noor is the first person he mentions in London from 1590s. So I think Dilip's question is something that you can begin the discussion with. So um, is it not necessarily, a, a, let's say, a caste, upper caste Hindu Brahmin paranoia? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I uh, mentioned that it was, I was talking about Hindu Sivaj movement, it was an upper caste movement, Bengal uh, Hindu, Brahmin and casters were mainly involved in this movement. And all over India, it was a movement of upper caste people. And I just skipped those sections that uh, Calcutta port played a vital role in the early years of colonial rule. And them, uh, them, uh, the migration of many women took place. Why are we excluding women here? And uh, uh, from a British agent from Guyana, we come to know that to procure enough women to make up the complement of a ship, the immigration agents in Calcutta are compelled to ship a number of women recruited from the bazaars and not of good character. Yes, uh, quite true. Actually, there was a significant number of women in Europe and England also from Bengal who primarily performed the role of nannies, of ayahs. There is a lot of representation. Uh, but to go back to the last bit of Dilip's question, would therefore you go on to also agree with him that there was therefore more of a subaltern cosmopolitanism because the subaltern groups were traveling, they were going abroad versus an upper caste regional caste. Regional. Would, you, would you comment on that? Yes. It was, we are talking about upper class uh, conservative mindset. Conservative mindset of the upper class people. There was no restriction for the lower class people. They don't have they don't have, didn't have to obey these shastras and rules and uh, penance and all these things. And uh, I found a, a piece of uh, knitted woolen cap in South African museum knitted by a um, named uh, knitted by a uh, woman called Malti, who went there in 16th century. So we are all, we are talking about upper caste yes. people. Yes. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, did you mention a book called Kalapani? If so, you can name the author. You did name uh, several texts. but Yes, was a it was a text. drama written by, written by Amritulal Basu. Uh, yeah. It so, was a yes, book of Kalapani drama Kalapani. written by Amritulal Basu, in which this uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu way of crossing the seas, Hindu way of crossing the oceans was reflected in much detail. And it was yes. reported in British newspapers several times. Yes. So I'm that they enjoyed, the, the, enjoyed yes, right. the song, enjoyed the drama very much. Yes. And uh, in that drama, uh, Thames became uh, Tamusha River. Hmm. London yes. became Tapu Forest. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, there is another question on Mongol Kapus, but before that, since we were talking about this uh, particular farce by Amritulal Boshu, uh, Kalapani, there is a previous question which was addressed to our previous speaker by Ihsanul Ihtisham. Uh, it was addressed to Anne, but in a way it also pertains to your presentation and therefore one would like your comment too. Before we move on to the final question by Swati, by Shati, which is on Mongol Kabbu. So this is this question by Ehsanul Yatasam is that do we need to look at the, uh, since you have uh, brought up so many performance texts, you mentioned plays, most, many of your, many of the initial texts that you mentioned, Kalabani by Omritulal Boshu, then Bilet Ferot, then by Narayan Chandra Bhattacharya, then Kolki Avatar by uh, Dijindralal Rai, etc. Since they are all plays, uh, would you like to also focus on the performative aspect since they were play texts, they were uh, dramatic texts to almost connect to a question that was unaddressed? Would the yes. performative aspect of these plays have any meaning for you in studying uh, the Kalapani, the, the build-up of Kalapani? Actually, uh... Reference. I got very, very little reference in archives or as from other sources. But uh, we came to know that these plays were performed regularly in Calcutta, in Darjeeling, and in uh, many other places in theater halls. And regarding Monosha Mongol and Chondi Mongol, uh, these covers were cited by different writers to support these sea voyage movement, that we had the tradition and the tradition had been reflected in these Mongol Kabbas. So in 19th century and in 20th century Bengali um, literature, especially in um, Bengali magazines, references were made to these Mongol Kabbas several times and quoted from these Kabbas. Yes. Quoted uh, I, think, I think the thrust of Shati's question would be that uh, how much of crossing the seas really is there in any of the Mongol Kabbas, like even in Monusha Mongol, which involves real, let's say, aquatic nautical travel, to what extent would it be geographically included within the deltaic region of Bengal itself? And to what extent would it really entail crossing the Kalapani, crossing really a trans-oceanic voyage? Uh, is there any Mongol Kabbu which directly deals with, I mean, that the Mongol Kabbos were invoked, it's understood ideologically, but is there any Mongol Kabbu to your knowledge which involves oceanic travel, trans-oceanic travel? And she's no. also asked a question about was Maloti a slave? And with that, we can uh, we can end our discussion. Please, uh, if you could uh, respond. Mongol, I, I didn't get any description, but I didn't uh, I didn't study uh, study it in detail. But from those writings, I come to know that there were um, descriptions of ships and other things associated yeah. with oceans. The, yeah. Many des many uh, detailing of ships, how to make ships, how, how to, yes. what were the names of different ships True. used in, in those True. voyages. And was Maluti a slave? In all probability, Maluti was a slave. I and mean, there were numerous Maluti such was, domestic Maluti helps all over Europe and, yeah, uh, throughout the 17th you, century. You may find it in internet in, in some uh, museum of <laughs> South Africa. Um, I just, at this moment, I can't remember the name of the museum, but in some museum of South Africa, knitted, uh, knitted lace and cap was preserved and written that a slave named Malti has made this for our great grandfather. And uh, from uh, the name was uh, somehow differently spelled, differently written, but um, one scholar has guessed that the name was Malti. Yeah. Uh, that professor was uh, a professor in the Ghana University, a Bengali professor. Sure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Shukarna Sharkar Shashmal and Indranil Chattopadhyay for your wonderful presentation. And we move on to the third and final presentation thank of the session. Sir. Yes, thank you very much. And which is by Minu Rabeka Mathai. She's from Sri Shankaracharya University, Kaladi, and uh, her presentation is called As Long as the Sun and Moon Last, Exploring the Indian Influence on Dutch Treaties in Southeast Asia. So your 20 minutes begin now. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. 
hello uh, i am meenu rebecca from the department of history sri shankaraja university of sanskrit and i am a phd candidate in the department so today i'll be talking to you about uh, the dutch political money was in its possession in southeast asia and in 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 south india in in malabar actually uh, and i'll be actually looking at how phrases in treaties between dutch east india company and regional rulers uh, uh, were used by the dutch east india company for the larger ambitions so i'm just uh, moving to the presentation i am actually a bit scared of the time limit <laughs> uh, uh, so can you move to the uh, next slide yes this is actually the map of malabar this is actually coastal region my uh, and susan has already told about malabar so there is no need to say a bit more about it so i am using treaties uh, concluded between dutch east india company and uh, regional rulers as a medium to understand the nature of the dutch company and uh, if we flip through the previous literature you know we have seen historians of an perceived dutch company as a corporate trading company uh, engaged only in export and import for profit as a mercantile company and against this trend many of the historians actually connected political activities with economic activities and some of the other historians like Eddie, eric odegaard he actually uh, come up with a phrase like company state and all uh like uh, and uh, some of the other historians actually brought about the emporialistic nature of voc um, uh, and they were actually saying that emporia that means market where the targets of the european seaborn entities and not territory per se and any territory acquired help to subserve the, the economic advantages uh, so coming to the larger arguments of my paper next slide please yes uh, these are the larger arguments of my paper and i would like to argue that you know voc had pursued a definite way of empire building throughout southeast asia and south asia whether it's indonesia in southeast asia or malabar in south asia and they used you know treaties for empire building and and i would like to argue that it was company by treaty as it had outright empire interest and engaged in complex state like activities and you know this treaty shows a kind of homogeneity and and they were connected throughout its possession so this is actually dutch colonialism and commercial interest per se so coming to the major argument of my paper i would like to argue that the cultural features of each region influenced dutch treaty making and the regional phrases were used as a sign to control the psyche of the natives so basically sanskrit the traditional vernacular language in india and indonesia has been used to control the psyche of the natives for the larger ambitions so the phrases and empire is largely connected you know moreover there was a sanskrit cosmopolitanism and a larger indian inf indian influence in the dutch east indies and the, in the indian ocean world so these are the larger arguments of my paper and i am trying to prove my arguments through a critical analysis of treaties uh, by juxtaposing treaties in malabar and southeast asia for slide please yes this is the first point and this is about a cross cultural trading strategy employed by dutch east india company and it seen that company actually established a genuine monopoly over nutmegs and cloves in its various possessions like ambon and uh, malukas and uh, banda uh, by by regulating its production on getting orders from amsterdam and, and actually directed uh, soldiers to cut down the trees on the shores to lessen its supply so you know it, interestingly this particular cross cultural trading strategy of the company can even be seen in malabar in south india uh, uh, you know dutch company used the uh, regulatory mechanism uh, they actually used that regulatory uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, for safeguarding the uh, op monopoly in malabar and actually punishments were also uh, were also given to those who actually broke the contract so these treaties actually shows a homogeneity and they were used as a device to implement the strategies next next one please yes and 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 uh, and uh, the uh, these treaties were actually a reciprocal arrangement a, a agreement and and this actually combined you know antagonism with commerce uh, you know this particular approach was visible in many of the possessions actually as a paper of power these treaties extended protection arms and ammunition to the ruler and his country with whom the contract was signed and besides the company regarded themselves as the guardian and protector of the country and and these were you know definitely a route 
to strengthen their foothold in the land so in a nutshell these treaties were simultaneously a defensive alliance and trading alliance in return for military protection can you move to the next one yes as this is the major argument of my paper so uh, see in last year uh, king of netherlands william alexander he has actually visited in india and uh, in, in his speech he was saying eternal alliance as long as the sun and moon are in the sky so this particular phrase caught my attention because i have seen this particular phrase in many of the treaties in 17th century uh, uh, and 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 you know this is the first point and i would like to argue that regional phrases were used by the dutch consciously for amiability and i am i'm and just taking only one phrase but there are many such phrases in circulation in the indian ocean world during the early modern period this particular phrase is uh, as long as the sun and moon are in the sky and and this is this is a phrase frequently seen in the dutch treaties in southeast asia that's in indonesia and malaysia and in south india that's in uh, in, in malabar and coromandel coast so this reiteration of this phrase by the king used earlier by the voc in the treaties in in, in india and in southeast asia actually says that this is still cherish uh, the tradition maintained the possessions centuries ago so in english it is uh, as long as the sun and moon exist when comes to dutch it is so long sun and moon dwa and when comes to malabar uh, in, in south indian language it's adithinum chandiranum ulla nalku and it is seen that this particular phrase has been variously rendered in treaties in malabar and coromandel and Pal- palebang and in johor and apart from these four places i haven't seen this particular phrase used by the uh, by the dutch uh, and and what i understood is that you know uh, by by romanticizing the intellectual part of these treaties with 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 uh, some uh, you know uh, with with some rhetoric some words carrying values you know we are see agreements during the initial stages uh, in southeast asia in and in south india it expected mutual understanding and a uh, friendship and attachment and, and and cooperation but actually closer analysis closer look uh, on the treaties and and events followed is enough to understand that there have always been deceit and uh, i would like to argue that the you know, cultural features of each regions influenced the dutch treaty making and, uh, and and legal system and these phrases were used as a sign to control the sake of the natives because you know this particular phrase has its roots from sanskrit so basically sanskrit has been used to control the psyche of the native for their larger ambition so the phrases and empire is largely connected and and uh, and you know the the beginning of this particular phrase in political gatherings and texts can be traced back to centuries and the question is uh, from where this this particular phrase began and whether the dutch used or borrowed uh, you know this particular phrase from their colonies or uh, so this this paper is actually an attempt to explore to epigraphical evidences uh, the sources of some this uh, this phrase and and i am arguing that there was sanskrit cosmopolitanism in the indian ocean region um so you know cultural features of each regions influenced the dutch legal system and led to many cultural engagements in the indian ocean world which connected empires uh next one please uh, okay so if eternal friendship was guaranteed in cochin to the face as long as the sun and moon exist or as long as the earth last the treaties of dutch with sulawesi is not the same it's it's more like you know chalk and cheese when it comes to sulawesi dutch used various phrases like we are brothers equally great and uh, with none above and none below we are slaves only to their way we will not force one to submit to the other we will work together with arm singing freely equal in working equal in sitting and you know so this phrase is reflects an urge for eternal friendship uh, but the political nuances lying behind this 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 uh, gentle words cannot be shelved in, in papers uh, because these were you uh, primarily used uh, as a promise to safeguard friendship and uh, and obviously as a route to political and commercial benefits uh, next slide ninth one so in 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 palay bank uh, it's agreed to maintain friendship as long as, long as the sun and moon shine and the day last uh, through the treaties written on 3rd july 1678 and 19 may 1681 uh, 
uh, and this the same has been rendered in johor too on uh, on 6th april 1685 so when it comes to indian regions malabar and koromand it's written as as long as the sun and moon last and sometimes added earth to it and in the treaty with raj of cochin signed on 28th march it's written as bhoomi ulla naalum rajavum ulandh kammiyum anyonyam snehavum vishwasavum കൂടെ ചേർന്നിരിക്കണമെന്ന് ഇരു പുറത്തു നിന്നും നിശ്ചയമായും കേൾക്കുകയും വേണം ഇറ്റ് മീൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ദ രാജ ആൻഡ് കമ്പനി രാജ മീൻസ് കിങ് ദ കിങ് ആൻഡ് ദി കമ്പനി വിൽ മെയിൻറ്റെയിൻ ഇറ്റേണൽ ഫ്രണ്ട്ഷിപ്പ് ഫേത്ത് ആൻഡ് ലവ് അസ് ലോങ് ആസ് ദി എർത്ത് ലാസ്റ്റ് സോ ദി ടേക്ക് ഓവർ ഓഫ് പോർച്ചുഗീസ് പൊസേഷൻസ് ഇൻ കൊച്ചിൻ യെസ് അസ് പെർ ദി ട്രീറ്റി സൈൻഡ് ഇൻ മാർച്ച് സിക്സ്റ്റീൻ സിക്സ്റ്റി ത്രീ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ബിറ്റ് മോർ എക്സൈറ്റിംഗ് യുനോ because that's brilliantly demanded the overlordship of portuguese possessions in cochin by romanticizing the particular clause and according to the treaty it's written as e kotteyude amshangalum naadugalum turuthugalum company parangiyoda aayittu ezhudi meedicha pole prathukal rajavinde tirunaama perkaayittu nanne anubavichu chernirikkanam ennu ippol companyoda aayittu yes it actually means you know uh, that's demanded by this particular clause that's actually demanded the transfer of portuguese possessions and made sure that this will not be questioned by raja and heirs as long as the sun and moon lasts so when it comes to the major argument of my paper uh, that's the greater indian influence and sanskrit cosmopolitanism you know this phrase have rendered from sanskrit word ajandri surya or ajandri arc mean, meaning moonlight Uh, so uh, next one please next slide so i have made some inquiries uh, inquiries next one next okay uh, inquiries regarding uh, the, the 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 origin of these phrases and and this produced some amazing research substantiating the indian origin and two inscription from kerala emphasizes that these phrases were used in india long before the europeans arrived and one of the inscription actually says that privileges bestowed upon a merchant in kodungallur revi koran in 774 and engraved in tamil letters in malayalam in copper plate with the knowledge of brahman divisions of panniyur and chovaram venad odanad and valluvanad given it for the sun and moon last and it's written by nambidi chadayan grand goldsmith of the chera kingdom and this next one the tarisapalli grand by stanu revi gupta for the Uh, when at king to uh, muruven sa periso in 849 which is in five copper plates written in battle to with signs in kufi can hebrew says that it was given for the day days that earth moon and sun exists so this actually says that this phrases were bo- borrowed by dutch from south india applied in southeast asia and used still by the dutch officials in international meetings to lose the other side and apart from chera inscription this is a feature of kakatiyas and cholas and chalukya texts and a 17th century evidence is the tamra shasana at shimoka engraved in engraved in, uh, in on uh, 1622 and and most of the chola inscriptions uh, 12 slide please next one yes most of the chola inscriptions from south india were written for as long as the sun and moon are, uh, moon sun and moon exist and this is a chola inscription written in sanskrit ganda and tamil in ad 1213 and says of do- donations uh, granted by kulotunga chola deva to keshava perumal and st- it stresses the existence of the grants as long as the sun and moon last and it seems yeah, you you can actually read it out uh, yes in the 36th year of reign of the emperor of the three worlds this one uh, and and next slide please yes Uh, so apart from the chola chera and chalukya and kate inscription this particular phrase is uh, you know it's not just limited to cheras and cholas alone it was actually a remarkable feature of inscription engraved on the ajanda caves you now plenty of inscriptions can be seen in ajanda caves with this phrase and and the cave number 26 translated by this was translated by bhagwan lal indra ji and it's inscribed on the left side of the front of the cave and it says that you know uh, uh, it says about the making of the caves by babbi raja the minister of amshaga raja and his son dev raja and his it says that as long as the fame lasts in this world so long uh, does the spirit enjoy delight in heaven therefore glorious work fit to last as long as the sun and moon should be made in mountains 
so additionally cave number 60 16 uh, an inscription on uh, it was written it's it's an inscription on behalf of Vara, varaha deva it says that as long as the sun shines with rays reddish like fresh red arsenic even so long may his spotless cave be enjoyed and cave in okay is and the cave inscription 17 it speaks for ubendra gupta and it says that may this hall out uh, out of affection cause the attainment of well being by good people as long as the sun dispels darkens by its rays so aditya was actually writing the vedic text too so i am about to conclude and and as this evidence is actually you know proof that there was an indian influence on the dutch, dutch legal system in the indian ocean region especially in indonesian islands and in malaysia and there was sanskrit cosmopolitanism on on dutch treaties in the 17th century which is still is even today uh, and and there was an inculturation in in, in legal tradition and it it's It, it, this particular phrase was seen only in the 17th century and i haven't seen this particular phrase in the 18th century uh, and it's obvious that sanskrit as a language has traveled across indian ocean through the dutch officials and uh, and, uh, and, and, and you know uh, the world is always connected and and uh, more than that uh, you know it's clear that the source language of this treaty must be you know the language of the ruler of the region they have contracted with the inscribers you know the writers might have uh, you know written the treaties in the language of the region according to the culture customs and beliefs as the existence of regional phrases from the source language in the treaties in dutch language and uh, and in in post portuguese also proves it uh, uh, and it was actually used by the dutch to lure the natives and to control the psyche of the Uh, natives as uh, uh, the later treaties after 17th century has no mention of this uh, phrases it might have you know it might have you know translated into dutch and even portuguese by the translators uh, as you know in uh, 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 there are single treaties with cochin in uh, in three languages in dutch language malayalam language and, and portuguese so the language and ember is largely connected that's it thanks a lot Okay, thank you very much for this fascinating paper and your suggestion that there was a Sanskrit cosmopolitanism based on this one phrase, "as long as the sun and moon exist." But uh, first things first, uh, as long as the sun and moon lasts, or as long as the sun and moon endures, or as long as the sun and moon exists, this is a direct quote from the Bible. This is Psalm seventy-two point five. So Psalm seventy-two point five directly says, "As long as the sun and moon endure." So this is a common phrase directly from the Bible, Psalm seventy-two point five. There can be comparatistic references to, I'm sure, numerous Indic sources, but to suggest that this was only Sanskrit might be a so. This is a wonderful comparatist project, but Bible Psalm seventy-two point five. is directly as long as the sun and moon uh, exists as long as the sun and moon endure so that is something that one uh, ought to be mindful of too because uh, it is a bi- biblical phrase it is a direct biblical phrase the dutch need not have learnt it uh, from uh, sanskrit or malayalam alone uh, the uh, it is it is a phrase from the bible psalm 72.5 uh, so that is that is a very important point uh, would you like to respond before we move on to the questions to this point of mind that psalm 72.5 in the bible says as long as the sun and moon exist i mean that is a quote from the bible uh, yes i didn't know that uh, you know the there's a mention of this particular phrase in bible and this is first time that i'm hearing the psalm 72.5 please just check it it's ad, ad verbatim as long as the sun and moon exist. and this is a common phrase it is used in so many uh, so many sources as long as the sun and moon exist because it's a direct biblical quote some i'm giving you the exact reference psalm 72.5 okay. all right yeah. okay yeah. okay okay okay, okay. so uh, that's fine but it's a it's a wonderful paper because such a comparatism that this phrase also occurs in so many sanskrit mm-hmm. sources malayalam sources it's a wonderful comparatism in this uh, as you rightly pointed out this great network of ideas and similar images as long as the sun and moon exists as long as mm-hmm. the sun and moon endures uh, this being uh, used in other cultures this is wonderful comparatively but it would not be proper to ascribe it to sanskrit sources only and therefore to deduce this as the root reason behind the possibility of a sanskrit cosmopolitanism because this is a biblical phrase psalm 72 ah. but let's move on to the questions and this is uh, i already see a series of questions that have come up uh, or at least uh, at least 
do certainly. Oh, this is a question to me. I'll, I'll, this is Mino's time. Uh, yes, so Dilip's question. So you can also see uh, native informants in Hortus Malabaricus, which I'm sure you are uh, absolutely familiar with. And uh, can one also see this kind of a continuity with uh, the East India Company? Uh, Dilip, I presume the Dutch and East India, oh no, uh, so English East India Company. Um, so yes, so would you like to respond to this question? Uh, I just want to read it out actually, like I didn't get the yes. question exactly, so I just want yes. to read it out. Should I read it out for you aloud? Yeah. I yeah. summed it yeah. up though. You know, I yeah. can... It would be great if you, if someone uh, of you can, can read it out for me. Sure, I'll read oh. it. So Professor Dilip Miron says, fascinating paper, the Dutch, uh, just a second, sorry. Uh, the Dutch drew upon native informants, as we see in Van Raedis Hortus Mal Malabaricus, which records the biodiversity on the SW coast. Local informants are mentioned by name. If they relied on local clerks and literate classes, then it is not surprising that the native form of agreements and phrases should creep in. Does this not show a certain kind of continuity that continued even with the early East India Company in Bengal? Bernard Cohen's work about how the East India Company participated in Mughal rituals wholeheartedly fits in beautifully with the co-production of knowledge under early colonialism. We need not think with the idea of a sharp break. Uh, yes, uh, actually, you know, um, yes, my point is that Dutch company, Dutch East India Company were the first who, you know, started a very extensive diplomatic documentation process. And, you know, the official actually started concluding treaties, though the European conception of treaties and nat native treaties actually differed much. And, you know, the commanders and, uh, and generals wrote diary reports on a very, you know, everyday basis and memoirs and memorandums and diary reports and registers and letters and missives were, you know, updated and, and then these were sent to Holland and Batavia and, and you know, these diary reports which had uh, information about natives, about their culture, about the language, about the institutions, conflicts, everything were, you know, uh, kept for future references for, you know, future commanders. Uh, yes. Uh, I think, yeah, I have answered your question. Yeah, I think the thrust of the question is that is there anything exclusive about the Dutch model of interaction? Uh, because you seem to suggest that the Dutch yeah. would have been particularly instrumental in this Sanskrit cosmopolitanism. One very important point that you made was the Indonesia-India connection. And yes. to therefore Sanskriticate, if we could uh, coin a word like that, like Islamicate, to Sanskriticate cultures. And since the Dutch operated primarily in those two territories and the 1825 treaty where Ben Kulin gets exchanged for all the Dutch holdings. And finally, the Dutch settled down only in uh, Indochina as opposed to India. So I think the, the trans-oceanic uh, India-Indochina connect could be one of those exclusive things that the Dutch focused on. But nevertheless, uh, would you think, to go back to the question, would you think there is something peculiar about the Dutch model, which cannot therefore, uh, so is there a sharp break in the Dutch way of dealing, which seems to be uh, the focus of your paper? Or would it be common of all colonizers, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Danish, the French, the, the Germans, the English, all were doing this only. So there's nothing particularly exclusive or peculiar about the Dutch model. How, mm -hmm. how would you like to react? Uh, uh, like I haven't, I, like I haven't thought about that. But like as far as I know, like I thought that you know Dutch actually you know uh, contracted with the native rulers and and uh, the uh, the 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 source language of the treaty was in you know uh, the, the in the in the local language in the in the regional language and uh, this was actually I believe it you know like I haven't seen any you know Dutch model Dutch treaty like I have actually juxtaposed the Dutch treaty and the Malayalam treaty and uh, you know uh, it interestingly you know. Uh, there was a Portuguese Cre Creole in in in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in in Cochin also. So like uh, the uh, local rulers, uh, the native rulers, even uh, one of the ruler in in Kote, I mean the uh, ruler, he actually knew Portuguese language. So there was nothing like Dutch Creole in in Southeast Asia and even in Cochin. So like I don't know like why there is a huge gap in this this particular aspect. Like, like, and interestingly, you know, there was a Dutch school, Dutch school in Kote, in in Tekunkur. Uh, there was a Dutch school and, uh, you know, languages were taught in this particular school. Uh, but this doesn't uh, last long. Sanskrit was 
stored there, then uh, Portuguese was stored there, then Dutch language was stored there, and this actually operated in the later uh, half of the 16th, 17th century. And this didn't last long. Uh, so like uh, maybe uh, the company saw their eclipse worldwide after 17th century. Uh, this may be the reason. Uh, but uh, like, uh, you know, like what I believe, uh, like I have actually just opposed uh, Dutch treaty and the Malayalam treaty. And like, I found that this, this two versions is similar. Uh, so like what I understood is that, uh, you know, the source language of the treaty was the local language. So, um, you know, this was, uh, you know, a diplomatic maneuver, I do believe. So uh, there is nothing like Dutch model, I do believe. I don't know, like I have to check it out again. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Right, uh, there is a question addressed to me, which I am very consciously avoiding, but there's another <laughs> the final question, uh, which is, and of course, if there is a minute, I'll definitely comment on it. Uh, so uh, by Anupama Mohan, so she sees that this phrase, as long as the sun and moon exists, so not only is it a biblical term, as I suggested, but even in much of uh, indigenous nations and much of Cree cultures, etc., in Canadian prairies, the same phrase occurs. So she complimentary, uh, she is complimentary to your paper that maybe this can form a template of a far broader uh, eco-critical, uh, let's say, premise uh, and promise. So how would you comment on this? So this phrase yeah. has, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like uh, I am a bit tense because I know that like uh, when you said that it's seen in the psalm, like my argument is already, you know, it's already over, you know, whatever. Uh, I didn't know that this was seen in, uh, you know, psalm, like uh, I didn't know that. Okay, whatever, like, uh, like I didn't check whether this particular phrase is there in the Greek or Roman uh, illegal traditions. I don't know, like perhaps uh, this might be there, but I don't know. So I have to check it out again. Uh, we have one minute or so left. So that is a uh, moment that that is a long question. I mean, of course, uh, to and but in a way, it will connect to the previous question, which is to what extent the Dutch also contributed towards creolization. So the primary thing that one should talk about is Dutch Bengal School of Art. That is something that you can Google out. So creolization, not necessarily in verbal languages, but uh, creolization in the visual cultural domain, that would be a very major contribution of the Dutch, the Dutch Bengal uh, School of Art. Uh, and uh, uh, also, I mean, of course, the first college uh, in Bengal was established not by the English, but by the Dutch uh, in Dutch territory. Hooghly College is older uh, than, uh, than uh, Presidency College. But there is, there is so much to talk about uh, Bengal, the Dutch Bengal mercantile, and that would require an altogether different session. Uh, but uh, the, the, we should uh, concentrate on Minu's paper. But yes, I mean, of course, the Dutch were not there only in Malabar. The Dutch were there in several parts of the subcontinent particularly in Bengal too. And it all came to an end with the 1825 Treaty of Ben Kulin, the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, where they exchanged enclaves. All the English enclaves in Indochina were exchanged for all the Dutch enclaves in the subcontinent. And they carved out therefore their territories. The Dutch concentrated more on Indonesia and the English concentrated more on uh, South Asia. But that's another story. And it's time to, so it's a fascinating paper as, uh, as uh, Swati has also complimented you. So wonderful. And uh, I guess unless the organizers have something else to say, it's, uh, it's Abhishek, a reverse argument, indigenous cultures fed into translations. Um, yes, yes, possibly. It's absolutely possible because ultimately there is no pure Bible and the translator, translations that we have, even of Psalm 72.5, might well be, uh, ultimately Christianity is an Asian religion at the end of the day. And a much translated uh, version of the Bible is what we always have. It is always already translated. There is no Ur text. So quite true, Abhishek Pundit's point is well taken that it could be in this comparative framework. Maybe Psalm 72.5 is in itself, not an authentic biblical line, but maybe it itself is also precisely uh, I mean, kind of uh, impregnated with so many other cultural resources. But wonderful. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. And I must thank all the three uh, speakers. And uh, unless the organizers have something to say, I think uh, we are done. And thanks yeah. to all of you for being in the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's not an end. We again meet in one hour, 30 minutes for our last and final session of the day. So we break for tea virtually and come back at 6.30 p.m. IST.
Thank you, Professor Menon. Thank you, Shogata Baduri. Thank you, Nishad Zaidi. Thank you, Simi Malhotra. Thank you.